Next in our webinar series, let's talk about epilepsy surgery. I'm really pleased to introduce you all to Dr. Sandy Lamb, who's the Division Chief in Pediatric Neurosurgery at Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. And we're going to explore tonight all of the epilepsy surgeries. I'm not gonna do too deep of a dive on them, but really just intended here to introduce you to what the epilepsy surgeries are. Welcome, Dr. Lamb. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for joining us. So this is a, this is a tough webinar uh, in terms of content, but tell us about the epilepsy surgeries. Thank you. Um, so really this is intended to, to think about epilepsy surgery as, as a concept. And, and it, it's, um, uh, it, it's daunting because no parent ever expects their child to, to have brain surgery. Um, and, and to, to think about that, um, um, can be very scary, but but we're really going to unwrap this and 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 take away some of that mystique, uh, and also explain how do we approach this process. So um, so we're going to break it down to how a surgeon accesses the brain, uh, the different types of surgeries. So we're not going to really get into um, deep dives for any one particular surgery, but to really think about like what we're trying to achieve. Uh, with the surgeries that you might hear about, uh, and then um, and that will uh, entail looking at resections as a group, um, disconnective types of surgeries, ablative surgeries, including with uh, laser ablation and uh, neurostimulation uh, in its different forms, and then last we will will. Um, end with the role of epilepsy surgery, something I'm very passionate about, uh, why every child deserves to really have um, epilepsy surgery um, thought of in the whole treatment armamentarium of things that we have to fight epilepsy. Great, thank you so much. We feel the same way. <laughs> Wonderful, yes. Um, so I guess just starting off, there are so many different terms and different types of epilepsy surgery. And, and really it, it's dependent on, on the, um, the, the epilepsy diagnosis, uh, what the underlying uh, uh, pathology or etiology is, and, and really um, what types of um, uh, medical or surgical treatments it's amenable to. So you know, there's really a spectrum. And when we think about, you know, that spectrum, you know, the first thing is, you know, well, what does brain surgery mean? You know, how does a surgeon access the brain? So we think about this in 3D um, and the brain is, is really um, inside the skull. Uh, there are certain structures that, that we know that, that we cannot um, go through or traverse and we must avoid and some areas that are, are, um, are relatively safe. And also we tend not to think about making any type of incisions uh, or trajectories through the, the face area. So in thinking about that in 3D, uh, we also think about um, the, uh, the eloquent areas, uh, which, which means the parts that you really, really need, like moving uh, the motor cortex, um, the, the language areas in terms of generating language and, and receiving or thinking about um, understanding the language uh, and also um, uh, visual, um, how, how, you, how you see and sense the world. So, you know, a lot of times, you know, we can we can pick and uh, we can pick how we get to the brain, but we don't get to pick the pathology, right? Like why the seizures are there, uh, and what's causing the seizures. So that's really inherent to to um, the patient's brain, right? So so here there's all um, uh, all sorts of different scans. Um, on the left side is actually a, a cavernous malformation. Um, in uh, the next one with the arrow is a cortical dysplasia. Um, the one circled uh, with red is a hypothalamic hematoma, and then the one uh, to the right is actually a perinatal stroke. So this is just among uh, one of the, the few diagnoses that, that can um, 
uh, uh, cause epilepsy, and, and there are many, many more. Um, so uh, you will hear uh, a lot of different terms, uh, and, and um, what is causing the seizures in, in your child or your uh, family member uh, may be very different than what's shown, uh, but this is, um, this is some examples. Um, so you'll also hear different terms like uh, uh, an open craniotomy or more minimally invasive techniques um, like laser ablation or endoscopic. But really, if you look at, um, at these depictions, they're really getting at trying to do the same thing. Um, so this, this open craniotomy uh, in the upper left-hand corner uh, is, uh, is cutting through the skin, opening the bone, and getting to the, the middle of the brain for a hypothalamic hematoma. And over time, um, uh, laser ablation techniques or MR-guided laser interstitial thermal therapy. Um, so that's, uh, uh, that has been developed to really um, uh, focus some, some energy, some laser energy to be able to uh, burn or ablate that area. Uh, then the other depiction is, is an open craniotomy for a hemispherectomy, uh, which uh, some centers have now been able to do with a smaller incision uh, with the help of an endoscope. But um, I, I, I really um, respect what happens on the inside. So even though we say minimally invasive, um, that, that is really talking about on the outside, right? It's minimal access. It's a smaller incision. It's smaller looking on the outside. But what happens in the brain it is really invasive, right? I, I would call it maximally invasive. It's just minimal access. Um, so, you, you know, I think the opening um, really helps the surgeon get to the pathology in the brain, um, but it, I think it's very important to think about safety and to think about achieving the goals of, are we able to see and do everything that we need to do to stop the seizures? And, and that's really the goal of the surgeries. Um, so um, different types of surgeries. Before we jump into that, Monica, did, did I miss anything in terms of kind of thinking about, you, you know, how we get to the brain? Well, one comment I would make is I, I know a lot of families, we think about the laser approach or the endoscopic approach as being better because you're not opening the skull. Um, however, I, I have talked to some surgeons and, and I assume that you feel the same way based on some of your comments is the goal of the surgery is to stop the seizures. So if you, if the pathology isn't the right pathology for a laser, you have to open the skull because the goal is to stop the seizures. You have to get in there to see everything. Yes. Um, I know one surgeon said to me that there are some disconnections that he felt like he was he, he's operating blind even when the skull is open. So it obviously wouldn't be something to do with clothes, just with laser ablation. Just something to think about from the family side is I know a lot of times we'll say, but we want laser ablation because it's a smaller opening and hold on a second, it, it might not be right, the right kind of surgery for the child. Absolutely, I think that's a great point, Monica. I think. I think surgery, um, any surgery on, on your child is is a big surgery. Um, so e even though it, it looks like a, a smaller uh, a cut or a smaller opening, um, it, it still is, is uh, anesthesia and it's still surgery on the brain. So in thinking about seizure surgery, I, I think it's very important to, to define um, what we can expect. Um, you know, how we can do it safely and, and how to make that journey really the, the most um, worthwhile and the most well thought out that, that we can do. Um, so, um, so, yeah, um, you know, so remember, we don't really get to pick, you know, what, what the pathology is, but we get to pick what we think the, the best approach, the safest approach, and the most effective approach is. And I would encourage everybody to, to really ask questions, to um, advocate for your child, and, and to make sure you're comfortable uh, with, with what the recommendation and what the decision is, because you, you have a, 
a, a big role in that. Um, you know, um, your child is the most important thing in the world to you, and and you you really need to be um, a very active partner, um, and don't be shy about that. Yeah. Um, so we can go to the um, some different types of surgeries. Um, so there are some categories. Uh, so a resective surgery or a resection, an example is, is a temporal lobectomy, but it, it can really be anything that, that we need to remove, okay? So a temporal lobectomy is, is an example. So the way that I think about that is, is that if we need to re remove um, a, a certain amount of tissue or if it's a lesion like a cavernoma or, or a low-grade tumor or something um, that, that is uh, reasonably bulky, uh, we typically would need to, to open up the skin and open up the bone in, in a window or, or um, kind of a door. Uh, we'll close the door later on, right? but we have to kind of open that door to be able to see the anatomy and see what we need to see. So for a temporal lobectomy, um, if the seizures are coming from the, the temporal lobe, we would remove that. And this is the type of anatomy that the surgeons would go through, uh, opening the skin, the bone, then actually identifying uh, the, the uh, exact anatomy in the brain that they expect. Uh, and then in the green, it, it's really kind of our, our map. For, for what needs to be uh, removed um, for that. And then, um, uh, so these are kind of our graphics. Uh, and then that's kind of a, a resection, right? And then we close that bone um, like, like a door. Uh, and uh, and I think about the you know the when I look at a wall and the door you know we we open the door um, to to be able to get through but then when we close the door um, there are little hinges so they're typically little plates and screws that are titanium uh, that it's safe to go through airports and get MRIs uh, but really there's nothing wrong with the integrity of your wall right you you close the door um, and that's what we expect that the skull will heal. Uh, back together, uh, and um, uh, and you won't, um, you know, feel a defect or anything like that. But when you look at, um, you know, these kind of uh, this array uh, of um, diagnoses, the the one I've outlined in blue um, uh, with this lesion or this kind of bulky big thing, uh, that is kind of most amenable to a resection. So. Um, the the one uh, pointed to by the arrow, a cortical dysplasia. Uh, sometimes uh, a resection is offered, uh, and uh, and sometimes um, laser ablation can be offered, and sometimes uh, neurostimulation. So we'll kind of talk about that coming up. Uh, but typically, for for one kind of bigger thing that needs to be taken out, uh, we kind of go through those steps for a craniotomy and a resection. Uh, earlier in this series of webinars, uh, you heard about phase two um, monitoring, uh, and these are some examples. And this would also kind of go through more of this kind of resection algorithm. So say um, a patient needs a, a, a subdural grids and strips. So, um, and this is a depiction of, of what um, the grids and strips would be like to rest on the surface of the brain uh, as electrodes to detect seizures, to, to, uh, to be able to record that. So, um, so this is a, a design of how to cover uh, everything of interest and, and the blue is grids and then the rest of them are strips. But that would entail a, a skin cut and a bone opening um, to be able to, to get that exposure. A different type of phase two uh, monitoring would be a stereo EEG, uh, which would mean um, small um, uh, holes, small drill holes in, in the, the skull um, with uh, electrodes placed through the skin. Um, so these are kind of different formats depending on what it is that we're trying to sample and record and where we think the seizures are coming from. So the next is, is a, a disconnection, um, actually. So uh, the disconnection, um, I guess this is a trick. The cavernoma, the big bulky thing, should not be a disconnection, but the right side where we uh, are showing a perinatal stroke, that is typically what we think of as, as a disconnective surgery, and that would be a, a hemispherectomy or a hemispherotomy, where uh, in that instance, uh, the seizures are coming from one side of the brain, so the, the, the bad side, um, and in this patient, it would be the, the right side uh, where the, the stroke was um, as a baby. So 
when we think about different types of disconnections, uh, it really is to to have the um, the 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 seizures really not be able to propagate okay so not be able to to get to um the the, the good parts of the brain that that are working really hard to try to do uh to to try to do you know normal brain things but when the the seizures that are being generated are, are coming to kind of affect that it's very hard for that part of the good part of the brain to achieve its full potential so the for a corpus callosotomy, we're really trying to have the seizures not go from the left to the right or the right to the left, and it's it's typically aimed at uh, uh, helping um, drop attacks uh, types of seizures. So this is an example of how you get to this this middle structure, the corpus callosum, uh, that helps the right and the left side kind of talk to each other. And this is with a bony opening. And this is the corpus callosum, it's right in the middle, uh, and we're trying to actually um, disconnect that uh, or, or basically make a, make a trough, or, or um, I think about it like kind of like a, a wildfire. Um, Monica is, is based out of California and with all the forest fires, I think about the firefighters trying to kind of dig a ditch, right? Or, or how sometimes the, the fires can't get across a really big highway. What we're trying to do is really kind of like di dig a really big trough or stitch so that, or, or ditch so the fire can't really like jump across. And like, I don't want the seizures to jump across. So here I don't have to take out the entire red thing. It really is making a really, really big trough, uh, a really um, uh, defined trough or ditch so that um, so that the seizures don't propagate across. Um, and that's kind of how we think about disconnections, period. So when you think about hemispherectomy or hemispherotomy, it's really getting the bad side to not be able to, to talk to or propagate seizures through to the good side anymore. And in any method that, that your surgeon is talking to you about, uh, the, it really is trying to achieve the same goals. Uh, of, of really disconnecting the bad side from the good side. So there are different approaches described, but they actually all have four of the, the um, same cuts that uh, achieve the same uh, goals. So um, when, uh, when this is done open, um, it can be done from the, the side or actually from the top, uh, but they all actually do those four anatomical steps. Um, some are hemispherotomies and some are hemispherectomies. Uh, spherotomy or otomy means um, uh, whole uh, and ectomy means take out. So, um, so yeah, and, and these are the, the different types of steps uh, that need to be uh, done for the disconnection. And then this would be uh, an open type of uh, uh, approach uh, from the side. Uh, and the one that I just showed you is actually more from, from the top. So, you know, even though there are different techniques, what is done on the inside is actually the same. Uh, and, uh, and I do an endoscopic technique, but actually um, the, my steps on the inside actually follow those same, uh, same uh, uh, cuts that need to be made. Uh, and it's important to be able to make sure that we can do that safely and make all those cuts uh, in, a, uh, in a very complete way. Um, a TPO, or a temporal parietal occipital disconnection, or posterior quadrant uh, disconnection, uh, is, is uh, in my mind, a, a variant uh, of a hemispherectomy almost, um, because um, for this surgery, we're trying to um, disconnect three of the lobes, but actually leave the frontal lobe um, uh, intact and talking to the other side of the, uh, the, um, the brain and actually leaving those motor tracks being able to kind of talk to the arms and the legs as well. So here we actually need to be able to, to map and know exactly where the motor strip is and then do our surgeries behind there. Uh, but that is a form of a disconnective surgery as well. Uh, it's typically done open um, uh, or um, I, I do them endoscopic, um, but typically it, this is a, an open type of surgery as well. And really visualization and safety and making sure the disconnections are done uh, are, are the, the same um, kind of rubrics again. Now, ablative surgeries, um, you know, this is really kind of in evolution. Uh, this is a, a, a newer technology. 
that is uh, less than a decade old uh, for brain surgery, but um, we're realizing that, that there are um, many uh, different um, uses for this type of uh, approach. Um, and, uh, and, and it, but the, the principles are the same. Can we do it safely and can we do it effectively? And can we plan the surgery in a way to try to get uh, rid of the seizures uh, in, in the, the most successful way possible? So um, I told you the cortical dysplasia uh, outlined in blue um, with the, the white arrow um, can be resection, right, with, with the, the craniotomy, so the opening of the skull and, and removing that, or maybe with a, a laser ablation. And the, the hypothalamic hematoma, which you can see outlined in red, is really deep in the brain. Um, and uh, although there are open techniques and endoscopic techniques, uh, we've seen over time that, that the laser ablation seems very well suited to getting that deep in the brain uh, to, to uh, a relatively uh, small structure because there's a very long reach. Uh, there are some other uh, diagnoses like periventricular um, nodular heterotopia, uh, which is right al uh, along the, the, the ventricles um, or um, like this, but <coughs> um, around the ventricular walls usually that, that are quite deep as well. Um, and, uh, and, and laser ablation may be uh, a good approach for that, um, as well as a tuberous sclerosis, uh, which you can have multiple lesions in the brain. So, um, so what the ablation looks like is that um, it, it's a it's a, a poke hole in the skin, uh, and a, a drill, a small drill hole through the uh, the skull, and then putting. Um, uh, putting a, a laser fiber um, into uh, into the brain to the target, uh, and the the laser is um, you know it, it is a maximally destructive uh, uh, type of instrument because it it is designed to actually burn right or actually um, destroy that tissue, so that is not a reversible um, thing, uh, but you can imagine it it really does help you reach into the brain with with a kind of a, a small uh, instrument and get your target to be able to um, uh, to to affect that surgery or or that destruction or ablation, uh, but that the the planning uh, and and defining the goals is very important no matter what. So is it, there, it is surgery. Sorry, is there a maximum size that uh, in terms of an ablation? I think I was reading that. Anything bigger than two centimeters, you're going to have to make multiple passes, and then mm -hmm. it's possible if it's too big, then then you really have to go in with open craniotomy. That that's a great question. So so yes, if if it's a big bulky thing, um, it it would be um, it would be more difficult to um, to to be able to to burn that with the laser. So. Here, actually, if you look at um, you know the the target area, so we have a target, right? So our our laser um, fiber is is this straight um, uh, structure here, and then really the end of this is is really where we're going to have the laser activate. So then here um, in this orange is actually how we uh, how we can um, achieve um, damage or ablation, but basically damage this tissue. And then, um, and then at the end here is actually where you see that there's um, uh, uh, that that the the tissue is actually um, burnt. Okay, so that this is actually destroyed uh, brain tissue. So um, the the I think of it almost like um like like a lightsaber. You you know it it's straight, um, but and it's also only like the very very end of the lightsaber works. So you know you we wouldn't put the lightsaber in and like swish it around the brain, right? You, you'd actually only have the very, very end of it kind of light up. Um, so um, the, uh, in general, uh, two centimeters is kind of as, as, as wide or as kind of fat uh, uh, and wide as you can kind of get that, that, um, that laser to burn. Um, it depends a little bit on the type of tissue and it depends on um, if there's fluid, if there's cerebral spinal fluid or different arteries or um, a different type of like um, 
uh, uh, fluid structures uh, that is kind of dissipating that that heat energy away. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, if you think about just kind of the shape and geometry, if you are making a burn and it, it's generally kind of a, a round uh, type of shape, um, uh, while taking into account the different types of fluid and, and uh, uh, vessels and things. So you can generally burn something like a round shape. If you're trying to make uh, a, an oblong or, or, or a cylinder, you'd have to think about making multiple round um, uh, burns. And that's why you'd have to kind of pull back. Uh, and then you could make something that is more kind of like tubular shape. Um, but you, you won't be able to make a giant sphere shape. You'll, it'll, it'll really only be, um, stay pretty tight. Um, there are different uh, laser systems, um, uh, and uh, and some can make a, a, a slightly wider burn um, than than others. But the the ones that don't make as wide as a burn uh, are actually much better at at the very precise targeting, uh, where if you are in in the middle of the brain, uh, near um, optic tracts or, or areas that affect memory, you might want to use that smaller laser fiber to be able to have a more precise burn. If you have um, a, a, a tumor or, or a lesion that's kind of bigger, then you might want that bigger laser. So it, it really is trying to match your instrument to your goals. Okay. Uh, so this is actually another type of um, uh, uh, procedure. Um, so we talked about the corpus callosotomy before when I talked about it as a resective, uh, I mean, a, a disconnective uh, procedure and how we could do it with a craniotomy. So a, a little door uh, up top um, and we can do that open um, or endoscopically, which means you make a smaller door, you put in a little endoscope, which is a, a, a little surgical camera to help you look. Um, and then we, we make that disconnection or, or trough in the white matter at the corpus callosum. Uh, other uh, uh, groups uh, have used the laser uh, for this type of uh, corpus callosotomy. So if you remember the, the, the spinning brain with that red structure in the middle, you know, how do we apply this type of instrument? Your, your lightsaber that only activates at the very tip, can you achieve that type of um, cutting that red structure in half with the laser, knowing that you can only go straight and 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 burn in, in kind of you know round shapes, but can you make a whole bunch of round shapes that will help you burn this kind of like long structure? So it is um so so it is possible. Um, uh, not everybody's corpus callosum is shaped exactly the same way. Some are more curvy, some are more flat. Um, mm -hmm. So you know that is a factor, and also. Um, the amount of time that it takes to actually make these these kind of little ball shaped um, uh, shapes um, can actually take quite a long time uh, and, and take longer than what it would take if you were having uh, an open surgery or an endoscopic surgery. So um, the, the laser as well, um, while very precise, can cause some um, edema or, or some kind of swelling, um, some uh, some brain uh, tissue swelling next to the, the laser burn. So uh, that has to be taken into account as well. So so I'm showing kind of different ways uh, of, of doing um, the same surgery to show that, you know, it really is the instrument, but the goal of the surgery is the same, right? It's the corpus callosum. How do we, how do we disconnect that um, safely? So um, also you can pair laser ablation with stereo EEG. Um, so if you imagine any one of these um, uh, trajectories or these tracks, uh, a laser fiber could go um, down that as well if that was uh, determined to be the, the cause of the seizures. So, um, and that works uh, typically quite well in um, uh, cortical dysplasia or tuberous sclerosis um, or other types of uh, pathologies like that. Um, so we'll go into this kind of a uh, big bucket of neurostimulation. Um, before we do that, Monica, is there anything we want to address from the, the kind of cranial surgeries? Just one thing about disconnections, whether it's with a laser or endoscopically or resection, you're talking about cutting the white matter generally, is that right? It, exactly. 
And, and just to be clear, white matter doesn't grow back. The axons of the neurons don't grow back, so the brain won't reconnect. You're correct. Um, so, um, so making sure, so from a surgeon's standpoint, we make sure that we um, identify the anatomy and we disconnect it. So, so um, uh, actually, my 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 trainees will always hear me in the surgeries um, say, "If you were a seizure, could you could you get across?" Um, and and I make sure that that um, that the the white matter is disconnected, so that there's this kind of a big trough uh, or kind of this big ditch that that we've made, that that it clearly cannot um, get across, and that it's disconnected, um, and uh, and and that would not grow back. So typically, um, I think in the in in your context, you might be um, talking about if there's uh, um, seizures uh, that that persist. Um, that that, you know, that would make me think of, was there somewhere that is still connected, that that is not, you know, fully disconnected. So it typically is not something that we think of as growing back. We would think of as, you know, where, where yeah, where, where did we not make a complete trough? Where is it still, where are seizures still able to get through? Um, so that's a great point. I think sometimes when parents hear words like rewiring, uh, many think that, that might mean that the brain grows back the connections. Yeah. Um, it, it just kind of, we should be careful. You didn't say it, but we should be careful with the language we use sometimes because I think it can be confusing to parents during this time. Yeah, no, that's a great point. So I think, you know, rewiring or you'll hear about plasticity uh, in children. Um, that is really how the, the brain um, especially in younger children um, can um, can can adapt uh, can can kind of learn and adapt but but um, but it doesn't really grow back it's yeah. that uh, you know other parts of the brain can can learn um, uh, usually through um, a lot of help with therapies um, can kind of learn you know how to take over some of that function that that isn't um, it isn't working for the child anymore because of uh, because of um, the seizure focus or because uh, uh, of um, disconnections or, or any type of kind of removal uh, of tissue from surgery. So um, uh, so yeah, that that in in terms of thinking about rewiring, that it can be an opportunity in younger children for kind of um, uh, adapting um, but not growing back. Okay, so. Um, so stimulation, um, so neurostimulation has uh, a few different roles. Um, so, you know, typically you know, the, the, the best thing um, for, for a surgeon is really to find the area where the seizures are coming from, right? And if it's an obvious, like one, one thing that doesn't belong, like, like a tumor or a cavernoma, and it's irritating the brain, and it's from that one area, and all the seizures are coming from there, um, and that is in an area that, that is not um, uh, subserving uh, movement or language or, or really what makes your child your child. Um, if it's really not in any of those um, uh, areas that, that we can't touch, uh, that that's really the best case scenario and, and really the best chances for for seizure control or seizure freedom. So, so we're always looking for that. When we do all this imaging and do all the workup, we're always looking for, for a, a focal area or one area that, that we can move because we know that that's our best chance to help, help your child uh, through surgery. But now there are um, evolving actually more and more options for um, stimulation, neurostimulation, which means that even if um, it, it is the, the area causing the seizures is not in an, uh, in an area that we can take out, 
um, because it wouldn't be safe or because it would um, uh, affect language or understanding or interaction. Uh, we we now have um, you know ways to kind of think about you know how to um, deliver stimulation to the brain uh, to be able to uh, essentially tell it to calm down um, or to be able to kind of control the seizures or have the seizures not um, not happen and not propagate. So um, so this is kind of the spectrum uh, of what's available right now. Um, the, the vagus nerve stimulator, the, the DBS or deep brain stimulator or RNS, uh, the responsive neurostimulator. So I'll go through each one. Um, this is a busy slide, but really kind of thinking about um, the, the vagus nerve is um, we access it in the neck uh, and the generator is in the chest wall. So the vagus nerve um, is in the neck. It's actually on uh, both sides, but we typically choose the left side. And it has actually very broad connections up in the brain uh, and, and uh, uh, has connections very broadly in the brain. Nobody knows exactly how it works, uh, but we know that, that it helps about 50% of children um, uh, with refractory epilepsy in a, in a 50% type of way um, in terms of seizure reduction. So in terms of surgery, um, the, there's typically um, two scars uh, um, in, in a majority of practices. Uh, one um, to help access uh, the vagus nerve in the neck, and then one um, to put the generator in the chest wall. Um, sometimes it, it is uh, uh, right on the front uh, of the chest wall, or sometimes it's uh, off to the side near the armpit a little bit more, uh, and that can be placed under this muscle so it's less bulky, or right under uh, the skin, kind of depending on the, the size of the patient uh, and other factors. Um, so, in, you know, in terms of kind of frequently asked questions, uh, there's typically very little blood loss uh, and a majority of patients don't have to stay in the hospital after surgery. Um, so your surgeon will, will usually tell you about when it's okay to resume therapies and, and school. It's typically um, quite well tolerated and there can be different side effects. Um, uh, like um, like feeling a tickle in the throat uh, or um, a feeling kind of like there's a waver in your voice. Um, those things can typically be um, uh, mitigated or even work with uh, your neurologist as they're doing the programming. So, um, and we usually leave this in place um, and uh, uh, we usually give it um, some um, uh, uh, definitely a number of months and up to two years uh, to see really how it's working for the patient. Um, deep brain stimulator, um, uh, the trials, the big trial is the Sante trial, uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's approved for um, adults uh, at this time. Um, there is uh, the, the leads uh, are in the brain, uh, and the generator is uh, in the chest wall. Uh, the two most common targets um, are uh, the uh, anterior nucleus or the central median nucleus. So, um, so there are uh, different side effects uh, and, uh, and issues kind of depending on the targeting and also because it, it's, uh, it's hardware, right? So all of these um, stimulation devices um, are foreign objects, foreign bodies that don't belong in the body. So surgical technique, wound care, and making sure that the skin heals over the devices are really important. Um, so, you know, usually in surgery, there's different ways to do targeting. Um, and because the, the, the um, areas of the brain where the, the leads need to go are very, very precise, um, there are usually different ways um, uh, that a surgeon can choose to get to this very precise targeting. It can be with a frame, which you see on the left side, um, uh, uh, or um, a, a clear point system that helps with targeting, uh, or, um, or a, a robot. Um, and they're they're all um, uh, all trying to get to that that very precise targeting. Um, so let's see the responsive neurostimulation um, uh, is a, kind of a, a variant, um, but um, you'll see that the generator itself 
does not um, go in the chest wall. It actually is in, in the skull. So uh, we actually take uh, away a little bit of the skull bone to be able to fit this, this um, uh, RNS generator battery and computer uh, all in one um, into the, the skull. Uh, and that sits flush with the skull, um, nothing sticks out, uh, and the um, uh, it it uh, the device will record uh, and can actually um, uh, be downloaded. So that recorded um, brain activity uh, and and the uh, output uh, can be um, downloaded daily or weekly, uh, and uh, um, there's a lot of kind of um, patient interaction and engagement uh, and kind of maintenance uh, that we rely on the patient for. Um, and in terms of targeting, uh, there's kind of different examples uh, of how to um, plan uh, a responsive neurostimulation um, leads. So um, it can be if we're not able to remove um, the 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 um, the area causing the seizures. So if it's a, a, the language area, we would not remove that. Um, um, and we would actually put electrodes either on the surface of the brain or um, a, a, as a depth electrode kind of into that area of the brain. Uh, to be able to kind of to, to stimulate. So, and it can be in different configurations. It can be two um, kind of surface um, uh, strips, or it can be uh, uh, two depths, or it can be a depth and a strip. And, and it really is um, uh, how how the um, stimulation kind of, uh, I think of it as uh, how, how far, uh, what kind of geometry you, you can make with the stimulation going in between the two leads. Then it's connected to, to the generator uh, and, uh, and it, it learns the brain, uh, it, it learns the patterns over time. So at first it's actually in recording and, and essentially learning mode. Uh, and then later on, we would turn on the therapy mode. So once it learns what the, the, the patterns are, then it will know when to deliver the, um, the, the stimulation. So, so one is just eloquent cortex. We, we cannot, we, we uh, would not remove those areas of the brain because you really, really need them. So motor areas or language areas are, are usually what we think of for, um, for neuro, um, for this uh, uh, responsive neurostimulation. Uh, or there can be a combination of RNS with a resection. So we can say, for instance, we take out as much temporal lobe um, as is safe, but then once we get up to, up to um, uh, abutting the language area, we wouldn't take out the language area. We could put the neuropaste there. Mm -hmm. So there can be kind of different configurations. Um, and the, the safety outcomes uh, from adult trials uh, have actually been um, uh, very good over time. And uh, um, uh, the, the effects actually have been uh, have been actually better and better over um, the long term, and they're about um, nine years uh, of data now. So um, both for DBS and RNS, um, the really device-related and wound-related issues are, are really the, the um, very important uh, that, that, that we can try to control as surgeons to make sure that healing is perfect uh, and, and to make sure that our um, incisions and everything are, are, are away from that device. So um, uh, let's see. Um, What's the age age limit RNS? For RNS? Go ahead. The age limit for RNS? So, um, uh, so the trials were done in adults. Um, it's uh, the use in children, um, both for RNS and DBS are, um, are considered what we would call off label. Um, so the companies will not tell you yes please put this in young children um, but you know when 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 neurologists epileptologists and surgeons are looking at each individual patient we try to figure out what we think uh, is going to be the the best treatment option that would offer the best chance uh, at uh, decrease in seizure burden. Mm -hmm. So um, we have been putting these, uh, both DBS and RNS, uh, uh, in children. 
uh, and um, you know for the RNS um, well so for the DBS and the RNS we kind of think about growth a little bit um, so um, so how much growth there is left um, you know for in, in, a, in a young child getting to kind of adult size um, and then the other um, for the RNS is um, is kind of how thick your skull is because that that RNS um, generator has to kind of sit in that skull um, so uh, it depends on on the the surgeon and the center um, uh, um, I, I've done them in school age or kindergarten age kids, um, mm -hmm. depending on, on the seizure burden uh, and what the other options are. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, uh, and VNS actually has a very similar story. It, it was, uh, uh, um, the trials were done in adults and, and at first it, it was uh, uh, approved only down to, I think, age 12. And then now it's actually FDA approved uh, down to uh, a younger age, I think age four. So, um, and then the, the d different devices have different MRI compatibility um, kind of sign-offs uh, from, from the uh, FDA as well. So um, making sure that, that you know what model um, uh, was put in or, or is being put in and then moving forward, if that model is compatible with getting an MRI or not, uh, and if so, under what circumstances? Because um, okay. you wouldn't want the, the magnet in the MRI to, uh, to affect your device or, or have it kind of heat up in a way that that could cause um, damage. Okay. So, uh, yes, but each device has a lot of trial data, uh, uh, many, many kind of pros and cons, um, which is why uh, the, the treatment needs to be kind of individually kind of tailored to think, um, you know, within all of these options, what would give you the best chances at, at decreasing the, the seizure burden uh, or at seizure freedom um, and, and uh, increasing the quality of life. So, um, so yeah, so I think um, that is a, a really kind of brief overview there. There's um, really days worth of literature for every single thing that we talked about. Um, yes. So, um, so yeah, and then, um, you know, I'll introduce, you know, kind of with our last two, um, you know, slides with uh, information, uh, a topic that I care deeply about, and I know, Monica, you do too, which is access to surgery and kind of the role in surgery in children with drug-resistant epilepsy. So really early surgery in children can, can help a child achieve their full potential um, so that they're not being held back by seizures, not in a state of epileptic and Cephalopathy, uh, and also um, as everybody here on the webinar uh, um, knows and experiences uh, firsthand, is that um, you know there's a lot of healthcare utilization um, associated with epilepsy, but but really so much kind of direct and indirect costs and and, and a toll on on the the family the 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 siblings uh, of the patient and, and really your your community um, so you know when we looked at this study uh, I do um, health services research and um, uh, healthcare economics we actually looked at a national database uh, looking at children with uh, refractory epilepsy and looked at um, kids having continued medical therapy or uh, having medical therapy plus surgical therapy. And we realized that um, when we looked at uh, over 4,000 children, we kind of matched them to, you know, who who can, who had this medical therapy arm and who uh, went on to surgical therapy. When we looked at, um, at, at outcomes that we could measure, right, not even the, the, the quality of life um, uh, outcomes, when we looked at um, survival, uh, at two years and five years, the, the children in the surgical group compared to the medical group had higher rates of survival at two years and five years uh, after, um, you know, after our time point of comparison. And then also when you look at ER visits, um, uh, outpatient clinic visits, and inpatient hospitalizations uh, for seizures, uh, there were significantly fewer uh, of all of these uh, kind of healthcare uh, type of encounters in the surgical group. 
And then also in the surgical group, uh, there were fewer uh, anti-epileptic medications that were used at these two and five year time points. So um, I think each one of these is compelling, um, but you know, thinking about um, you know interacting with the healthcare system less, being in the hospital less, being in the ER less, you being on fewer medications and you know fewer side effects, needing fewer uh, medications, and, and really having that higher survival. So you know that has implications for. Um, SUDEP, the sudden um, and explained death of epilepsy, and really all of the other comorbidities that come along with epilepsy. I think even though epilepsy surgery is um, is is a big um, is a big thing to think about, when you think about the the big picture and when you think about kind of the long run, um, the 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 detrimental effects of seizures and epilepsy are 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 very, very far reaching. Yeah. Um, and having uh, and choosing a, an effective and safe treatment with the goal of, of um, uh, uh, seizure freedom or decreasing the seizure burden uh, really bears out uh, in the long run in multiple ways. Uh, and I, I think that's really important to keep in mind, um, to, to think about the, the long run and the big picture and, and what, um, what type of future uh, you're, you want for your child. So yes. I think um, thinking about surgery within the whole spectrum and armamentarium of, of what, what doctors have to, to help your child with um, is not, surgery um, should not be a last resort. It should be within the, the whole toolbox uh, of what we can help your child with. And then selecting the right one is really a big deal. But but it, it, we have a lot of tools. We we need to be you know have a chance at, at thinking about talking about them. Um, so really you know we want to learn. We want to always do better. Uh, we want to partner with each other um, in in the epilepsy surgery world and the epilepsy world, but also with with families uh, and and patients and really being part of a team together. So well, thank you. So much thank you I really appreciate you doing this webinar it's it's very it's so important for families to understand that you know it is their right to know what treatment options are available to the child and that means that where appropriate after failure of two maybe sometimes three medications epilepsy becomes a surgical problem it's no longer a medical problem and you as a parent have the right to ask for a surgical evaluation if you haven't had it. We still have parents in our community who are being told that you have to fail all medications before you're referred for a surgical option or surgical evaluation, and that's just wrong. So I hope that this webinar series arms parents with the information that they need to advocate appropriately for their, for their kids, because for many of these children, surgery is their only hope for seizure freedom. Thank you, Monica, for doing this. This is um, uh, much needed, and, and I think you're doing a great service for a lot of families who are looking for information. Thank you for joining us. We, we appreciate everything you're doing for these kids. Thank you.